Uh, let's start. I will start recording. I don't see in long term with these glasses. So we have a couple of people having trouble to Madrid today. I think this is oh, so yeah. thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back again for uh, this new colloquium at the Instituto de Astrofisica Andalucía here in Granada, in Spain. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Melanie Chevans from the Heidelberg University. And she will talk about the cloud, the cloud scale baryon cycle across the Nervi galaxy population. Melanie will be properly introduced by uh, Dr. Isabel Marquez. Please, Isabel. Thank you, René. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thanks again for, for attending this uh, Severo Ochoa Colloquium again program. It's a pleasure for us to, to have today Melanie Chevans. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Melanie Chevans uh, received her PhD from the Université Paris Diderot and uh, Soa Sattler in, in 2016. And she then obtained a six year postdoctoral position at Heidelberg University. Last year, she received an Emmy Nether grant to realize a complete census of the multi-scale matter cycle in, in galaxies. And for all who don't know, as um, I, it was my case uh, also, uh, this kind of grant is very similar to the Spanish uh, Ramon y Cajal. So you have uh, financial support for yourself and for your team. So it's even better than, than, than the Ramon y Cajal. Uh, yes, and, and it is uh, for about uh, six years, this is the case now for you, so it's uh, great. And she's now leading the Galactic Matter Cycle group in, in Heidelberg. Uh, Melanie Chevance is a young postdoctoral researcher with high impact work on the relation between giant molecular clouds and star formation, in particular on feedback mechanisms. And just uh, as an example, uh, her paper, The Life Cycle of Molecular Clouds in Nearby Star Forming Disk Galaxies, that was published in 2020, so it's very recent, and has already more than over 130 citations as, uh, as of yesterday, right? Um, we already had the pleasure to have uh, Melanie Chauvins as tutor in our, our advanced school, several two advanced schools on, on star, star formation. Uh, and today uh, uh, we have her in person in a colloquium, and we're very, very glad to have her here uh, on the cloud scale variant cycle across the nearby galaxy population. She will present the first systematic characterization of the evolution be timeline between giant molecular cloud life cycles, a star formation and feedback in uh, about half a hundred uh, star forming disk galaxies, showing that these measurements constitute a fundamental test for numerical uh, subgrid recipes of star formation and feedback in simulations of galaxy formation and evolution. Thanks again, Melanie, and, and the floor and the microphone are yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction and for the invitation. Uh, yeah, I'm very, really, really happy to be here today to have this uh, seminar in person. And uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about the cycle of matter in galaxies between gas and stars. Uh, which is driven by star formation and feedback, and how we can use a high resolution multi wavelength observation of the nearby galaxy population to constrain and characterize this cycle. This is not working anymore. That should work now. Okay, so we know that on the larger scales, galaxy evolution and galaxy growth is set by the balance between uh, gas gravitational inflow which you see here, whoops, ah. <laughs> which you see around the, uh, along these uh, this green filaments here. So the cold gas being accreted on the galaxies and the feedback uh, due to, to star formation from the galaxies, pushing back uh, hot bubbles, hot gas back into the interstellar uh, intergalactic medium. And you can see that in green, in, uh, in red here on that simulation. But really this process of star formation of, um, of galaxy growth and galaxy evolution is seeded on the cloud scales in galaxies. And we've seen this simulation here already yes, yesterday in Diedrich's talk. Um, but what is important to notice is that you see the dense 
uh, gas collapsing, forming stars, which you don't see here on this, on this image, but you see the effect of this star formation at these bubbles here where the gas is being pushed out by star formation, by the, the effect of star formation. So it's really this process of star formation and feedback is really seeded at the, at small, on small scales in galaxies uh, and affects the evolution and the growth of, uh, of entire galaxies. So how can we uh, describe this process? I'm going to start very uh, with, with very basic concept that should just to all be on the same scale. But what you see in a galaxy is gas and stars. The gas can be in different components, so with diffuse interstellar medium and giant molecular clouds. Within these giant molecular clouds, small uh, fraction of small fraction of this gas is going to uh, condense under the effect of gravity and form stars. With radiation and winds, the stars disperse the remaining gas, and this is what we call stellar feedback, but encompasses many different uh, processes potentially. So this process, which is which you can also see with uh, on this simulation, you can see that it takes place over millions of years. Right? There is about um, on these simulations, it takes about five or 10, 10 mega years for the clouds to be con completely dispersed. But another point that is important is that this is not just a linear process. You go from gas to stars, but because of the feedback, this is actually a cycle in galaxies. Where So the cold gas accrete on galaxies and form the diffuse interstellar medium. Um, the clouds form and assemble, they form stars, but then the gas get redistributed, energy matters, metals, get redistributed in the, in the galaxy through the effect of uh, stellar feedback, but also dynamical dispersal of clouds. Eventually, with, throughout all these mechanisms, um, the gas is pushed out of the galaxies. It's heated gas exposed from the galaxy, which will eventually cool down, accrete back on the galaxy, and then this cycle can start again. But really, the big question that, that we have, and because this cycle takes millions of years, we cannot observe it direct, directly. And so the mass flows that are going through this cycle, how long it takes, what fraction of the gas is actually converted into stars, what is the efficiency? We, can, we, we cannot answer these questions easily um, with observations. So if we can't do that with observations, maybe we can go to simulations. And turns out this is even more difficult because star formation happens in a cosmological context where all scales are connected. Again, you go from the large scales, 10 to the 5 kiloparsec here. One galaxy is about 10 kiloparsec, but you need to zoom out by several orders of magnitude to find a massive star forming region within which single stars and uh, protostellar disks, protoplanetary disks are going to form. And we saw that already in Diedrich's talk yesterday, but even without going to the planet side, here it's 12 orders of magnitude in distance that are connected. And they're really connected because of feedback. So the energy, momentum are redistributed from the small scales to the larger scales. So you cannot just simply cut and try and model one part of this, uh, of this uh, dynamical range. And the worst case is that it's not only spatial, but also um, this covers different time scales. If you want to look at the galaxy formation and evolution, which happens over giga year time scales, and you also want to resolve the explosion of a supernova, which takes place uh, on a couple of, of years, then again, it's nine orders of magnitude here that needs to be covered. So it is really impossible, it is compu computationally impossible to model the processes of star formation and galaxy evolution from first principle, because it's, it's, it's just uh, too much in terms of orders of magnitude. So that's why models and simulations use uh, subgrid, sub-resolution prescriptions to basically avoid simulating the small scale, but just provide an input for, for that, a subgrid input. 
the big problem is that these inputs, so the physics of star formation and feedback on the small scales, are uncertain. And this leads to, to big uh, uncertainties in the simulations. And one example is with the star formation. So if you look at um, this empirical relation here between star formation rate and, and the gas surface density, you see that observations line up very uh, closely on, the, on this schmidt kennicott relation. So OK, we can use that in simulation and say, we have that much gas, we produce that, much, that many stars. This is not that simple, because it depends which gas is going to form these stars. And you see that for the same initial condition, these three simulations are using a different criteria for which gas is forming stars. The cell gravitating gas, the gas above a certain density threshold, or the molecular gas. And for the same initial conditions, you end up with totally different simulated galaxies, totally different morphologies and properties. Um, so if you don't know which gas is forming stars, you can't make predictions for this. Uh, for what the galaxies actually look like. And this is the same for feedback. Again, these are three simulations with, different, with uh, in, uh, identical initial conditions. The only thing that differs is the feedback mechanism that is used, whether it's supernovae, photoionization, or a combination of both. And again, you see that the resulting uh, pre, uh, simulated galaxies are completely different. So, okay, so, Resolving this problem of linking star formation and galaxy evolution purely with simulation doesn't work. We need, we really need to go back to observation. This is the only way in which we can answer these questions. So what are the basic questions that we want to understand? The first one is how do the gas clouds in galaxy collapse to form stars? Is it just by free fall or are the clouds supported maybe by magnetic field? Which feedback mechanism halts star formation? It's supernovae, photoionization, a combination of several mechanisms. And finally, what is the resulting rate and efficiency of star formation? So I've shown this relation just on the slide before where gas, surf um, gas surface density is linked to the star formation rate. Um, but these two quantities here, so the star formation efficiency and how long it takes to form stars, are first degenerate and uh, they're very difficult to constrain observationally. They're unconstrained observationally. So it is uh, difficult to answer whether star formation is inefficient and fast or efficient and slow. Basically, all these questions, and I'm going to uh, demonstrate that in the rest of this talk, can be answered if you're able to measure how long things take how long it takes for clouds to collapse, how long it takes for the feedback to destroy the clouds. And uh, obviously, if you're able to measure this uh, time scale for star formation, you can break this degeneracy and answer this question. So let's, um, and yeah, but this question of time in astrophysics is difficult because the processes take place over millions of years again. So, in particular, the lifetime of molecular clouds has been a long-standing problem where many studies have suggested seemingly contradictory values from more than 100 mega years, based on the uh, presence of clouds between galactic arms, to 15 or 10 to 50 mega years in the LMC, for example, like classifying clouds. So it's basically saying, counting how many clouds don't have stars how many clouds have some stars? How many clouds are associated with clusters? And the, um, the relative fraction of, of clouds associated with these different phases can tell you something about how long the clouds spend in each of these phases. Uh, and finally, in the center of our galaxy, so in the CMZ, uh, several studies have suggested about one mega year cloud lifetime by following a cloud along a, a stream of gas. So we have two orders, more than two orders of magnitude here in, um, in, in, in the cloud uh, lifetime. And it has been unclear up to now whether this variety is physical or if it comes from differences in methodology uh, with especially the, the middle case here requires to uh, resolve the clouds. 
uh, and also is subjective to is subject to cloud to a subjective cloud classification. So okay, this is not an easy question to to solve, but maybe we can try to go back to to go one step back and look at two extreme examples uh, about cloud lifetime. So are the clouds living for a very long, much longer than massive stars, or do they live for relative short time scale, so similar to the, the massive stars, so a couple of mega years? In other words, do we have a quasi equilibrium between gas and stars, or do we have a rapid cycling? What, what would that mean in these two extreme cases? In the case of a quasi equilibrium, clouds form stars for many dynamical times. In the other case, clouds are destroyed by massive stars immediately and live short. Observationally, what would you see? If there is a quasi equilibrium, gas and stars are correlated on the small scales. There are clouds and they keep forming stars. On the other case, the cloud will disappear immediately. So gas and stars will be decorrelated on the small scales. So let's now, with, with this prediction, go to observations and see what, uh, if we can answer this. So I'll take this example of NGC 300, which is a flocculent nearby galaxy. It's, as you see, lying very nicely on the smith kettikut relation. And let's try to see if we can see a correlation or decorrelation of gas and stars. So first, if we start on the large scale, so at low resolution, I'm showing here H alpha, so the basically tracer for star formation, and CO molecular gas. And the ratio of these two quantities is here. You can see that at low resolution, this map here, this ratio is pretty flat and pretty wide. It's, it's relatively homogeneous throughout the entire galaxy. Now I'll play a, a small movie and uh, we'll go to this large scale uh, or low resolution to a high resolution with ALMA. What do we see in the, what will we see if there is a quasi equilibrium? Well, still a correlation between gas and stars. So still this whitish color in principle. Now, if gas and stars decorrelate, what we expect is to have regions with only gas, so blue and regions with only stars, so in red. Well, you can see, maybe you already have an idea about that, but you can see very quickly as we go to higher and higher resolution, how this decorrelation becomes really clear with only gas, only stars here and only gas here, for example. Um, so there is a decorrelation scale between gas and stars, which means that there is a rapid cycling between uh, gas and stars. And this is a way of measuring this decorrelation. And this is, actually what I'm going to show in the second video, which is now for simulation. So again, stars, gas, the ratio of these two, and a way of quantifying the decorrelation. And you see that the exact way in which stars and gas decorrelate is uh, directly linked to the timeline that exists between the, uh, between, so the, the gas, then star formation happens, uh, here in the, this purple color, and then you see only stars. So I'm going to, because this is a simulation now, we can play with the duration in this time scale, in this uh, timeline, and see what, how the decorrelation evolves. So let's start first with the uh, duration of the H alpha phase, of the stellar phase. You can see that making it, I'm sorry, <laughs> Making this phase longer here or shorter varies the number of uh, stars that we see, but also varies the asymmetry here between these two branches. By symmetry, you can vary the duration of the uh, cloud lifetimes. When it's longer, you have more clouds in the simulation, and the asymmetry between the two branches varies as well. Yes. Yes, I, yeah, so yeah, I didn't want to go into the detail, but because you ask, this, the, these branches are uh, the gas, so the CO to H alpha flux ratio. The top branches is basically measured when focusing on cloud peaks. So the gas to stellar flux ratio is high because you focus on gas. 
And this uh, bottom branch is when focusing on stars. So the gas to star ratio is low because you look around stars. At large scales, gas and stars are correlated. So the two branches merge. At small scales, the two branches decouple because yeah, you focus either on one or, or the other. So the third quantity that we can uh, look at is for how long gas and stars are correlated. So this is this, this middle part here, which you can, uh, yeah. Uh, and you see that making it longer makes the two branches go flatter, so there is less decorrelation. When it's shorter, the two branches are uh, further apart because there is more decorrelation. And the last quantity we can uh, identify on this diagram is at, what, at which scale the two branches separate. So what is the separation scale between, uh, between individual regions? So that gives us an, an understanding of how measuring the gas to stellar flux ratio on small scales between gas peaks and stellar peaks can help us by looking at the asymmetry, the flattening and the decorrelation scale, we can directly fit this gas to stellar flux ratio and measure the cloud lifetime, the feedback time scale, so how long gas and stars are uh, correlated and the separation scale between regions. And directly that gives us a way of measuring the star formation efficiency, the feedback coupling efficiency, and, and other secondary quantities. So let's just go to an example very quickly. So again, NGC 300 here, we measure the gas to stellar flux ratio and the, its decorrelation on small scales. We fit this decorrelation and we measure a cloud lifetime of about 11 mega years. Uh, star formation, so quite short, right? If you remember the, the ranges of, uh, of, scale, of a timeline that I, I was describing before, a feedback time scale of 1.5 mega years and a star formation efficiency of about 2.5%. Um, so yeah, we have a short feedback time scale and a rather low star formation efficiency, only a couple of percent. So now let's look at how these quantities vary within this galaxy, or if, if we see a variation. So I'll just zoom into a couple of these quantities, not all of them, but I want to look first at the cloud lifetime and compare this with a theoretical prediction. So the cloud lifetime in this galaxy is about 10 uh, mega years, and you see that it's lying very nicely between the free fall time, the GMC free fall time, and the GMC crossing time, and it's relatively constant throughout the galaxy. For the feedback time, it's also relatively constant throughout the galaxy. But the interesting thing to point out here is that this uh, feedback time scale of about 1.5 mega years is well below the, time scale, the characteristic time scale for the, first, for the first supernova to explode. So before the first supernova explodes, the gas is already gone. And this can be, this matches very well the time scale for photoionization or stellar winds to destroy the clouds. Um, another uh, thing that we've looked at is, so this separation scale between different regions. Um, again, it's relatively constant throughout the galaxy at about 100 parsec, and it matches very well the gas D scale height. That means that in this uh, galaxy, star formation is feedback regulated, right? If you have a region of star formation that is going to blow a, a bubble, so uh, push the, maybe push the gas uh, with stellar winds, for example, when this bubble reaches the gas D scale height, it will depressurize and therefore set the typical distance between galaxies to that D gas D scale height. Okay, so with NGC 300, we have described star formation and feedback, especially this part of the cycle, but only for one galaxy. And that is not going to tell us how these processes are uh, representative in the entire universe. So for that, we have the FANGS collaboration, um, which stands for physics at high angular resolution in nearby galaxies. 
for with which we have uh, collected over a couple of uh, several years now high resolution high sensitivity multi wavelength observations of a large sample of galaxies and to give you an example we have 74 nearby galaxies at about uh, 50 parsec resolution with alma uh, we have several with uh, the Hubble telescope, about 20 galaxies with Muse, and now very soon we'll have the same 20 galaxies also covered with JWST. So with the combination of all of this data, we can really probe each phase of the star formation cycle and characterize what are the time scale of this cycle and what are the mass flows throughout this cycle. So this is a subset of these galaxies here. And for each of them, we have measured the decorrelation between gas and stars. And an in important result is that this decorrelation between gas and stars is universal. You see the separation of the, the two branches here on small scales everywhere. So there is a rapid cycling, again, between cold gas and young stars in all of the galaxies that we've looked at. And this is the work done by my student, Jayon Kim. So she has, for all of these galaxies, measured the, uh, the uh, time scale of star formation and feedback between the cold gas and, and the young stars. And to be more quantitative, so here are the, the uh, histograms of the values that we find in this sample. So cloud lifetime that are short, between 5 and 30 mega years. Clouds that are efficiently dispersed by stellar feedback within one to five mega years. So uh, again, very often pre-supernovae, uh, pre yeah, previously to uh, before the explosion of supernova, and I will come back to that later. And a star formation efficiency that per cloud that is low between one to eight percent. So now we can answer this question and say, really, that star formation is fast and inefficient. And this actually this this low star formation efficiency correlates very well to what is found in, in high resolution cloud scale simulations um, if we compare to to the uh, range of uh, gas surface density that we have in the observations we see you see that there is a range of cloud lifetimes and we think that this range is not due to error bars or, or is not random, but is actually linked to environmental properties. So we've tried to correlate with a couple of properties, but some of the uh, stronger signal is with the um, uh, galaxy stellar mass. So you see that there is a trend of uh, shorter cloud lifetime at uh, lower mass galaxies, but also that correspond to lower metallicity uh, galaxies. So, which is represented with a color bar here. And we also see this correlation, this same trend with the gas, H2 gas surface density. So, clouds become shorter with, uh, in, at low mass, low metallicity, low surface dens uh, density galaxies. And this is probably indicative that there is a relatively longer, um, that there is proportional, proportionally a relatively longer CO dim phase in these low mass, low metallicity galaxies. Because the gas there is atomic gas dominated. So we don't see the CO, but the clouds are forming in H1, for example, before we see them in, a, uh, in CO. Uh, then for this, so we see this, this variation of uh, cloud lifetime between galaxies, but we can also actually see that within galaxies. And this is what we've done for a couple of these galaxies, not the full sample, but nine of them. And you see that the cloud lifetime varies as a function of galactocentric radius in a non, uh, a not easy way. So there are many factors that probably influence this. To try and understand this, we've compared this with theoretical predictions. So the free fall time and the crossing time, which I have shown previously, but also the galactic, the, the time scale predicted for galactic dynamical processes. So the clouds can be affected by a spiral arm crossing, epicyclic perturbation, the global free fall time of the ISM, cloud cloud collisions. They can also be destroyed by shear. So, can we predict the, uh, the observations 
of the cloud lifetime that we see with these predictions. So I'm overplotting here on this uh, radial profile the, the prediction. So in red, cloud li uh, free full time and crossing times, and in blue, the galactic processes. And you see at first sight that there is a quite a good match between the observations and the, the theory. But now if you look into a bit more detail, you see that some of them agree, some of these galaxies agree more with the red lines, so local processes, free full time. And some of these galaxies agree well with uh, being affected or regulated by galactic processes. And I'm not going to develop too much about that today, but if you want to, uh, to ask me questions about that later, please uh, feel free to do so. And this is, again, this showing yeah, a similar thing that the GMC, free for, uh, the GMC lifetime is relatively well correlated, but sometimes longer than the GMC free fall time. Okay. Um, now let's look into more detail, not into just the GMC lifetime, but at each phases independently. So you can see that the orange part of the timeline is relatively long. So it means that there is gas and no stars, and that occupies between 70 and 90% of the cloud lifetimes. So this is really a long part of the cloud that is apparently the cloud is doing nothing. But is that really true? So um, <clears throat> for that, we've looked at uh, infrared emission. So you see that in young embedded, uh, in, in uh, young stellar regions that are still embedded, the stars are not going to be detected with H alpha, which we have used as a tracer until now but they are going to be detected with infrared emission. So potentially there is another phase here between just gas and gas and stars, which includes embedded stars, which we can probe with infrared emission, and in particular with a 24 micron emission. So we've done that for a couple of the, nearby, of the most nearest galaxies, because these actually these uh, six galaxies are the only galaxies in the universe for which we can do that at the moment. And again, it's uh, work done by my student, Jayon Kim, and she has measured that about 1.4 to 3.8 mega years is actually of, of the cloud lifetime, is actually not completely in inert, but uh, young stars exist. Uh, they're just too embedded to be seen in H alpha. The good thing is that now with the approved uh, James Webb Large Program will have 19 more galaxies for which we can do that. And we can confirm these results and potentially see if there is again a dependency with metallicity, with gas surface density, et cetera, which can yeah, give us a hint of, uh, of the earliest phases of stars, um, how they are the earliest phases of star formation and feedback are uh, acting. Now let's focus on the Second part of the timeline, so this purple uh, part here where gas and stars are correlated, and this is where the feedback is acting. So for all of these galaxies, it's short, between one and five mega years. Um, and again, we can look in more details into a subset of these galaxies. We have looked at environmental variations uh, of these feedback time scales. Um, so you see the, the feedback time scale here as a function of stellar mass. There is a, a nice correlation here, metallicity and GMC gas surface density. There is somewhat of a trend here too, but we suspect this is due to the correlation of these quantities with the, uh, with the galactic stellar mass. So we do see a correlation of the feedback time scale with environmental properties with this tight correlation here with stellar mass. So how can we understand that? Again, we went to theoretical predictions. Um, okay, the most obvious feedback mechanism is supernova explosion. This happens between three and 15 mega years typically for the first supernova. Other feedback mechanisms are photoionization, stellar winds and radiation pressure. So we've calculated the uh, typical uh, char the characteristic time scale for these mechanisms to act. And I'm not going to go into the details of these equations, but 
basically what we do is to solve for the equation uh, so we know how at the speed of expansion of this of the bubble blown by feedback and when this bubble reaches the size of a cloud we consider that the cloud is destroyed and this is how we get this characteristic time scale for each of them okay so we want now to compare the uh, the characteristic time scale for this prediction with our observations so this is what i'm going to show here the predicted feedback time scale and the observed cloud dispersal time um, the one-to-one -one relation here shows that okay if the predicted feedback time scale is longer than the observed one this process is this mechanism is too slow it arrives after the cloud is already destroyed if the data points are below the line it means that this mechanism is fast enough and can actually destroy the cloud in this observed time scale so okay let's start with supernovae first for all the galaxies that we've looked at the time scale for the first supernova is is too long compared to the observed destruction time scale so supernovae are too slow there when they burst out the, the cloud is already gone now we can do that for uh, photonization and winds and I've actually put them together for simplicity just taking the fastest of the two for each galaxy I, um, and you can see that the for these photonization and winds all the data points are below here are below the line the lines which means that photonization or winds so early feedback mechanisms can destroy the clouds potentially even faster than what we see but this is not a problem so the first thing that shows is that pre-supernova mechanisms play an important role in dispersing the cloud. And the second thing is that their coupling efficiency is not 100%. Otherwise, they could act much faster. But there are probably um, photons that are leaking out of the region and actually don't, are not used to destroy the clouds. What that shows is that if we come back to these three simulations here, we now can say quite with a lot of uh, certainty that supernovae alone are not going to be enough to destroy the clouds. And real galaxies look more like this. So with photoionization or maybe a combination of photoionization and supernovae, but not like this. So now we can uh, actually calculate and quantify this coupling efficiency. So very schematically, um, we expect that the coupling efficiency is high when the stars just are just forming. And at some point, the cloud is completely gone and this efficiency drops to zero. So I'm just going to calculate basically the integrate or the average value here of this efficiency throughout the, the lifetime of the, uh, of the well, throughout the, the feedback time scale. So the feedback coupling efficiency that we measure are a few tens of percent, right? or a few a few percent to a few tens of percent which is qualitatively similar to simulations the other thing that we noticed is that um, there is so that that high fraction if if the feedback coupling efficiency is only a few percent it means that i don't know 70 to 80 percent of the energy is actually leaking out and that explains at least partially the observed diffuse ion, uh, ionized hydrogen emission throughout galaxies. We saw some environmental dependence of this coupling efficiency, and in particular with metallicity here. So if you ignore that one data point, there is a trend for a lower efficiency, coupling efficiency at lower metallicity. And this is in agreement with studies that show that the ISM is more porous at low metallicity. So you have less coupling between the gas and the stars. And finally, we don't really see a trend here of the coupling efficiency with the GMC gas surface density. And that tends to indicate that photon leakage rather than radiative cooling likely dominate these energy losses throughout the feedback phase. So let me just summarize this, this part on the feedback. So we see that early feedback mechanisms are very efficient at dispersing clouds prior to supernova explosions. The average coupling efficiency is a few percent to a few tens of percent. And we see environmental 
uh, variations of the feedback and of the coupling efficiency with galactic properties. And this has strong uh, consequences on the redistribution of matter and energies uh, in galaxies and for the subsequent star formation within galaxies. Now, we can go uh, further now that we have these basic measurements because we can determine in which environments supernovae detonate, but we can also not just look at CO and H alpha, but really start probing the entire timeline for star formation for cloud assembly, star formation, and feedback and cloud descriptions. So it's not just a three phase process, but using multi tracer information from MUSE and JWST, we can really push that to the next level. And this is something that we have actually done for the large Magellanic Cloud, where we have all of these data at really high resolution already. And I'm going to show a uh, next observational movie now of so the, the large Magellanic Cloud here, which for now you see in H1. In H1. So you see the atomic gas here and you see the rotation. This is actually the true rotation of the LMC as measured with Gaia. And you can see that for a very long time, the clouds are atomic, right? You just see H1 and this phase takes about 40, 45 mega years in the LMC. At some point, these clouds will start uh, we uh, will start collapsing and for molecular gas, which you're going to observe very soon here in green, you start seeing the molecular gas and then everything is really fast. You start forming embedded stars. So with 24 micron and then you see H alpha so when the cloud is gone and then ionized uh, emission lines. So this will be able to do for yeah, many more, about 20 galaxies in the nearby universe instead of just one at the moment. Um, and in particular, it's really interesting to measure the atomic cloud lifetime. So this is the, the assembly time of the GMCs. And we see what we see in, in, the, uh, in the LMC is that this measurement, so about 40, 48 mega years for the H1 cloud lifetime, is consistent with prediction from uh, being driven by galactic um, galactic dynamics. And yeah, if you remember a couple of slides ago, we've compared the, the cloud lifetime with, uh, um, with, with so the, the combination of the shear, spiral arm crossing, cloud-cloud collision, et cetera. These large-scale processes drive the assembly time of the, of the GMCs in the, um, in the LMC. We can only do that for the LMC at the moment, but with the future SKA, we'll have the resolution to have H1 observation for many more galaxies. So with all of this, what we hope to do, what we will be able to do is really to characterize the mass flows throughout this entire cycle. And use this to test and improve subgrid physics used in the simulations. And this is uh, the last part of my talk that I would like to, to touch on. So you remember this uh, image from the begin very beginning of my talk, so NGC 300, where we've seen that clouds in, uh, in blue here and stars in red are decorrelated on the, sm on the, uh, on the small scales. Okay. Do we also see that in simulations? So we've tested this in, uh, in a simulation here which include feedback from supernovae and photoionization, and where all macroscopic quantities, for example, uh, star formation rate, gas mass, depletion time, etc., and the cloud properties, so cloud radius, uh, velocity dispersion, cloud mass, etc., all of these quantities are consistent with observations. So this simulation, in principle, reproduces very well observations. Now we've tried to see if there was a decorrelation. So we've measured the gas to stellar flux ratio on small scales in these galaxies. And you see the two branches here, the two very flat branches. This is for the simulations. And for clarity, I've overplotted uh, an observation here, so NGC 300, where you know, we've seen that there was a decorrelation. In the simulation, there is no decorrelation. Those two branches are almost flat. 
which means that clouds and gas are coexistent for tens of mega years instead of a feedback time scale of one or two mega years. So there is a problem here in this simulation. It doesn't reproduce this rapid cycling between gas and stars. So all of these quantities, they get right, but in a way from, for the wrong reasons. So we've tried to, to go around this problem and improve the photoionization in, uh, in a similar simulation with inputting, by inputting enough energy to disrupt the uh, clouds when the stars start to form. And it turns out, if we do now the same experiment, gas and stars are decorrelated on the small scales. And again, I can overplot an observation here, and you see that it's, this galaxy is almost an analog to NGC 4254. We see a similar decorrelation here. So this energy is what is needed for matching this observed decorrelation. OK, so we can try to, to do that to test whether simulations reproduce the observations or not, and try to modify them in order to, to match the observations. But we can use, uh, but we can actually be even more empirical. And uh, uh, Diedrich showed that a little bit yesterday. But what, we, uh, what we're uh, doing now in this new empirically motivated physics suite of simulations is to uh, ad adopt an empirically motivated feedback model. So not try to reproduce supernovae, um, photoionizations, winds individually, but just input the specific terminal momentum that we've seen in the observations. So we directly measure that in observations, the cloud radius, the star formation efficiency, the time uh, for the feedback, and inject the momentum as a function of time, just yeah, following from, from self-similarity here. So instead of resolving or trying to resolve from first principle each individual uh, feedback mechanisms, we just combine them in a, in a package and say, okay, this is how much momentum they input into the gas. And that actually works really well. Um, again, supernovae only, you see the, the decorrelation here on small scales is tiny, right? The two branches are, are relatively flat. Now, if we input this additional momentum, you see that they reproduce very well the, here it's the observations from the LMC. So by construction, here we reproduce the observed cloud life cycle without having to tune different uh, feedback mechanisms. So finally, we can uh, I think I've shown you how we can characterize or how we've started to characterize this entire cycle between star formation and feedback in galaxies. And we can now answer, answer these questions from the beginning. So uh, cloud lifetimes range between five and 30 mega years. They're environmentally dependent. They're destroyed by, uh, clouds are destroyed by early feedback mechanisms, so mostly photoionization and stellar winds. Supernovae are also important, of course, but at the later stage. And star formation is fast and inefficient. So low efficiency and rapid time scale for the cloud lifetime. In the near future, will this measurement so will be extended to cover a wider variety of galaxies. Um, so different morphological type, different moments in cosmic history, and we will time resolve the timeline for star formation and feedback. So how, as I, uh, as I showed in the LMC, we can now do that for the entire nearby universe almost. And we use this to test and improve subgrid physics used in the, in the simulations. So it is now possible to determine the mass flows through the matter cycle in galaxies, both in observations and in observations and try and understand physically what these processes are. And my last slide is if you're interested, if you're a master's student or if you know a master's student that is interested, I have an open position, PhD position to start this awesome. So please feel free to, um, to contact me or to talk to me directly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Melanie, for this wonderful talk. And now uh, it's open for a question. I understand that the question in the room 
will be managed by uh, Reiner. That's correct. Yes. Yes. Enrique, please. Do I need a mic, maybe? Uh, I'll repeat the question. Okay, the microphone is super sending. Okay, uh, uh, the whole presentation, let's see. I have thank you. The comment and the question, the comment is about your videos. I, I put your attention how much this could improve uh, in just uh, adding sounds to your movies. <laughs> Also, because it's inclusive for me, but for mm -hmm. I think our experience adding sounds to the, the simulation is, is a great tool. It's just a comment, just consider that. And the question okay. is, uh, I'm wondering to what extent does this import, I mean, the, in the cycle that you mm -hmm. mentioned for the organic matter? Yeah. Because you know, does this uh, is uh, slowing the, the feedback rate with, uh, because, well, you know, the stellar winds, the rotation pressure. We, we also know that in uh, environments where star formation rate is huge, the amount of dust can be huge. That is the case of e rigs for instance. Do you consider dust in your, in your simulations? Um, okay, so the question is about dust. How how is dust important in in the cycle? Just repeating for them. Um, so in the observations, I think the effects of dust can be quantified uh, on in using different ways. So for example, that's what we're doing using um, uh, infrared or mid infrared observations is 24 micron emission, um, and Okay, this is not the only parameter, when, but one parameter that we use to characterize the impact of dust is metallicity, because the gas to stir, the gas to, to dust uh, ratio also scales relatively well with metallicity. Uh, so that's the parameter that, that we have looked at instead of the gas to dust uh, ratio, for example. Um, Yes, that, does that answer your question? Not entirely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, amazing talk. I think the amount of data and the progress of the project itself is uh, really amazing. And, Thank you. Uh, but I, I, I had a question similar to Enrique's one about the dust mm -hmm. on, in your simulation, but in general, too. But I understand that, the, that you are, from your answer, is that you are including the observation, infrared observation of dust, and you assume that the metallicity is a tracer of the dust to gas ratio, and that would be inside. That, that's your answer. So, okay, I, I think I. I, I see now where where you were uh, going. So yeah, just to repeat the question is again how to treat dust, but in simulations, right? Yes, yeah, that's one thing. One thing is uh, well, I, I assume you, you show there have shown the twenty four microns. Uh, yes. So I, I assume you, you use the dust uh, infrared observation uh, already. So it was into the simulation. So for now, for now we haven't implemented this part in the simulation. We've just looked at the global uh, so that that was what i showed was the the, uh, the momentum inputted during the feedback phase we haven't made the distinction whether it was at early phase so during an embedded phase or at the later stage but it's just one global value for now but we we plan to go into more details into that uh, i don't think there is a detailed treatment of dust in the simulations but maybe did like you can say more about that I think, yeah, I, 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 like, I like your question, but your answer, but I was wondering whether the, in terms of the feedback, whether there is any coupling between the, the, the dust is, uh, what, from the point of view of the cooling, uh, I think you're happy, I think it's happy too, but yes. from the point of view of cooling and lines oh. and so on, but the point was, is, is there any coupling uh, uh, taking into account between the dust and the uh, the radiation pressure, the, for instance, the uh, surface effects in the dust, the, the coupling uh, between mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. gas, and this kind of thing. Uh, is, is this kind of uh, 
let's say effects yeah uh, are these effects so yeah the question is is there coupling during the feedback phase between winds radiation pressure and the dust so the answer is i think that we we don't really need to do that here whoops we don't need to do like a detail coupling depending on the mechanisms and that in a way the the strength maybe one limitation also but also one strength of this method is that we know what the momentum is so this is the momentum that is inputting to the surrounding it doesn't matter what exact coupling there is between radiation pressure and or winds and, and the dust grains it's just the total momentum should be that at the end that's in a way yeah all we care about here yes So we would need much smaller resolution, I think. Isn't there a point that you don't need the microphysics? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. In a way, it's included, yeah. but yeah. subgrid. Yeah. Um, the question was whether we think the process of a big bug is set. So the dust, the dust can be, uh, let's say, you have a surface. <coughs> you, know, you can share, you can share the, the dust grain. It's coming. Yeah. So what is the effect of that? General. So the the mic in a way the microphysics is included but not resolved. So in terms of grain charging, I cannot answer that question here. We would need, yeah, to look at something different. Yeah. Yes. No, no, no. Yes, of course. Yeah. In, I mean, are you happy with the res spatial resolution? Let's put the, the question in a different way. Are the sizes of the clouds well defined with present day uh, observational facilities? So you can define a cloud, uh, you know, 100%. So, yeah, that's a good question. For the method that we're using, we don't need to resolve the clouds. So, in many galaxies, they are resolved. In some of the maybe a little bit further or the more distant one, they're they're not fully resolved, but we don't need to resolve them. What we need to resolve is two different clouds, the separation between clouds, and that we do easily because it's a couple of hundreds of parsecs. If, if I may make a remark, I think, and and, and maybe the difficulty lies in that it, this is observational stuff. So we're really not interested in the details of the simulation. I think is that maybe the point? I mean, you, you, the decorrelation, or that you see it in the data, and it should be in the simulation. This decorrelation we see in the observation should also be in the observation in the simulations. Exactly, but you don't need the details in the simulations. So this is and yeah. <laughs> this is empirically motivated. Yes. yes. So we don't try to resolve from first principle. But yes. what we want is to yeah, use the observations to constrain the, the details in the simulations. Rainer, all, can you can I suggest to the person that made the question to approach to Melanie so we can oh. follow the discussion from here? Okay. Thank you. Very nice stuff. Again. Exactly, uh, because they cannot hear the questions, right? Um, I've loved your your presentation. I, I think a great talk. Um, I have one question and one more or less comment, or I don't know exactly or adapt. Um, the the question concerning the uh, sample of the, the fang sample you've shown concerning the data. So um, I've seen that there are ma mainly these galaxies, right? And not not very perturbed. So when you're talking when you're talking about envir environmental effects. Or properties you're talking about within one uh, each galaxy so my question is um do you think is it important to consider other stronger or more perturbed uh, environment environmental situations for instance in mergers because you've talked about changing morphologies but not not about the mergers yes thank you uh so yes these are all these galaxies we have a relatively large range of star formation and masses, for example. 
You can also look at the center of the galaxies versus the outskirts of the galaxies. Um, so there is quite a broad range of environments. Um, of course, so we have extended this sample to early type galaxies. That's still something different. Mergers are difficult, or, or starburst would be also difficult in general because of the method itself. Uh, so the method that uh, to measure, so to translate the decorrelation between gas and stars into a timeline, you need a relatively smooth star formation history. If the star formation is very different today than it was 10 million years ago, or 50 million, or 50 would be okay, but 10 million years ago, if it changed very quickly and radically, then there are large uncertainties on, on our measurements. So that's why for now we've looked mostly at these galaxies where this is well constrained. And you had another point. Yeah, the, the other thing was with respect to the comparison you've made with the uh, simulations and the LMC. Mm -hmm. So you're using the disks again for simulations, right? So your simulated galaxy is a disk galaxy? When you compare, no, when you compare your, with the LMC predictions and, and data, yeah, so, so your simulated galaxy is a disk galaxy, but the LMC is not a disk galaxy, right? I have to highlight that this is mostly for visualization for, uh, okay. yeah, for visualization here that it was a good match between the LMC, it turned, it, it, it's, by chance that there was a good match between the LMC okay. shape and the simulation. But yeah, it doesn't mean that this is an LMC analog. There are other quantities that make it different. Okay, yeah. because in, in that case, in that respect, the environmental, the local environmental situation may be different in, in those uh, mo mostly regular galaxies. Okay, Th thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. I realized I was not talking in the microphone when I answered this question. So just briefly, the, uh, this comparison with LMC was mostly for, uh, yeah, by chance we noticed that the timeline in this simulation matches the timeline in the LMC. But of course they have other properties that differ. So that was just for illustration purposes, basically. <laughs> okay. This is probably a very naive question, but but this is my questions are like that. So when you do the, the simulation here, yeah, I see all the gas and the feedback. It's the more you go to the center, the less bubbles you see. Basically, if at the very center, there's never a bubble forming. Is that because of ambient pressure or because of the gravitational potential? Or, or why don't you really... I mean, there's lots of gas at the center and high gas densities and... What's happening at the center? Why is there always compact gas? No, I think you said it. It's uh, yeah, the high, the high pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, you saw us before. I think it's a few slides back. Properties of the molecular uh, clouds, uh, like the time scales for the light, and also stellar feedback. It's like histograms, I would say. So I just have, let's say, one question, and depending on the answer, maybe two. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So these are uh, properties of, let's say, the whole population of molecular clouds for a given galaxy, right? Yes. Uh, well, no. The histogram here is for the entire, it's for one average group. properties for each, for the in the ensemble of galaxies so, yes so all, all the galaxies together so it's um, let's say it's data in the histogram is a galaxy and is characterized by the mean properties of the molecular clouds of that galaxy yes and um, okay so the second question appears <laughs> uh there seems for instance in the stellar feedback that there is some kind of two-peak distribution so this is something related with the statistics of the sample, for instance, because of the low statistics, or have you test if other properties of the host galaxy may take um, a part in this too big distribution? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, I had this question myself, and 
we haven't really yeah managed to see why there was this bimodal distribution in the feedback you you can also maybe even see a hint here in the mm -hmm. in the cloud lifetime well, I, what i think is that the sample is relatively limited it's 50 data points here so yeah it's it's not clear yet if if this is real or if it's just small some small numbers statistics we are looking into that yes between arms between arms and interarms centers versus further out we've done that for 10 galaxies uh the rest of the sample is going to follow so it's yeah um so yeah there, there are lots of possibilities still to do if somebody wants to work with that with us like <laughs> please there is a lot of work to be done yes <laughs> so so you have barred galaxies as well right uh, yes. Do, do you find any differences in the in the important places where you have bars? So in 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 terms of correlations and things like that. Thank you. This actually relates to the question you asked before with mergers, because with bars and especially at the end of the bars, you have this fa potentially this fast variation and this synchronization of the star formation event. Uh, so you have gas accumulation for a while, and then suddenly you'll have a lot of star formation. So that makes the star formation rate not constant in these, um, in these regions. And in particular, you see that some of the extreme values, oops. So here we have this large upward arrow bars here. This is in cyan, this is the end of the bar. So here, the cloud lifetime seems super long because, yeah, it's still accumulating properly, proper, probably. And at some point, you'll have like this, a sh very short cloud lifetime compared to the rest of the galaxy. Well, this is probably because there, is, there was just a burst of star formation at the end of the bar. And, and we're biased toward the shorter cloud lifetime. And so this why it's, it's a bit difficult to make this measurement here because of this variation. And so you are not so prone to being able to form stars? Uh, well, I think in principle, this is not a problem for the method, like the fact that, yeah, clouds maybe are living longer in this environment. This is, we could measure that. Um, maybe we would need a sample of galaxies and do an average just for the bar end if, if all the other properties of these galaxies are similar to really, the problem here is that you you're not probing fine or you're not probing in a in a statistically representative way the timeline you're biased because many regions are suddenly all star forming or all in in gas so you're not you don't have a homogeneous sample of the timeline and this is a problem you mentioned just a curiosity you mentioned before that uh, the spatially the star formation and the h1 are not registered are not in the same place mm -hmm. so that holds for the h alpha for the optical tracers of the star formation and also for the infrared too yes so also the infrared pre let's say proto stars uh, region are also displaced from the h1 maximum some of them yes um so this is what I was showing here. Here. So we use we use the decorrelation between uh, so the infrared, so embedded young stars, and the decor so the decorrelation between the infrared and the uh, molecular gas and the H alpha, and you see that indeed there are places where you see only CO place where you see CO and 24 micron, place where you see CO, 24 micron and H alpha, and then CO is gone. So it's only 24 micron and H alpha. Thank you. I don't know if there is, Online. are there questions on Zoom or? Online, there is no question. No question. <laughs> 
can I have a lecture room? So, um, first of all, let me please thank again, Melanie, for a great talk, really. Thank you. Second of all, I mean, Melanie and Diederik, I think they have talked about very fundamental things in the last two days, so they will still be around today. So you are very welcome to come. They are currently in Anchon's office. Please contact them in any means possible. Discuss with them. Come along. They will be very happy. And uh, finally, we also, I, I'm, or we, I mean, we three, maybe four, so we'll go to, to dinner tonight. So if anyone would like to join, uh, a glass of wine, something to eat, and some scientific or otherwise discussion, please contact us. Thank you. Okay. Uh